Hi class, welcome to this first video on our new unit on biodiversity and ecology. So this in particular is going to be about maintaining homeostasis. Remember that all organisms need to grow, need to reproduce, and maintain that dynamic homeostasis. So what's really cool about this unit is throughout all videos, especially this one, we're going to be using all different sorts of examples highlighting this biodiversity of our Earth to show these, these concepts of homeostasis, for example. So bacteria, plants, animals, animals, ecosystem cells, all sorts of examples. So to begin, what is homeostasis? Well, when we break down the word, it literally means steady state. But what does that mean? It's a maintenance of the internal balance. So even when the external environment is going to change significantly, that organism or that system maintains a balanced internal environment. So when you hear that, you probably immediately think, oh, that's like an endotherm, right? Like humans, even though it's zero degrees outside, we maintain our internal body temperature. And while that's true, you certainly need to understand that endotherms are not the only things that undergo homeostasis. All living systems undergo homeostasis, all the way to the simplest living system, which is that of a cell, all the way up to the biosphere. So cells, bacteria, plants, insects, ecosystems have to maintain a homeostasis, such as this coral reef. And as I said before, the entire biosphere is a dynamic homeostasis, and lots of things that we're going to see can disrupt or maintain that homeostasis. And so the biggest way that homeostasis is maintained is by these feedback mechanisms. So I won't spend a lot of time on this since we already learned about this earlier in the year in our communications unit, but just to quickly review, negative feedback is the way that you're going to return to that target set point. So if your blood sugar is too high, you're going to release insulin to get back to your set point. Same with body temperature. Uh, so getting back to that homeostasis. Positive feedback is sort of the opposite. The, the response is going to be amplified continually um, until you, so you can get further away from that set point. So the example we gave in class was a woman who is in labor. Uh, she's going to continue having contractions until she has that child. And you also did projects about how this feedback can be disrupted. So for example, diabetes. The pancreas is not producing insulin, so the blood sugar is not being regulated. So we're all about talking about the environment. And we've talked about this all year. How do organisms respond and interact with their environment? And so two big things, behavior and physiology. So they respond through these two mechanisms. And some very easy examples that you've known about since you were little kids are hibernation. So um, big animals such as a bear might hibernate during the winter to conserve energy. And birds, when they sense this change in climate and weather, they migrate uh, to a warmer climate. So a little assignment here that we're going to have throughout this video, name one behavioral and one physiological uh, response to a changing environment. Now, hopefully all year we've been doing a good job of relating all of these concepts to evolution. So can we relate homeostasis to evolution? And the answer, I'm sure you know, is a resounding yes. So this is where it gets really, really cool. So when we look at all this biodiversity of life, what we notice is, is this continuity of homeostatic mechanisms, which shows us that we have a common ancestor. But then when we look at it more closely, we notice, oh, you know, there are little tiny changes and differences because each organism has to adapt to their own specific environment. So we're going to be looking at lots of examples for this. So bacteria, crustaceans, plants, animals, fungi, all of these have homeostatic mechanisms. They all have to obtain nutrients. They all have to eliminate waste. They all have to control their internal balance. And we're going to see that we have similar ways of doing so, even though we're very different. So I'm going to give you um, some six, six examples, and then we're going to look closely at two of them. So underneath obtaining nutrients and eliminating waste, plants. Plants need carbon dioxide from their environment. They need to expel oxygen. And terrestrial and aquatic plants both do this, but they do it a little bit differently. Respiratory systems in animals. So an aquatic animal like a fish is different than a terrestrial animal like a human. So we're going to take a closer look at how gills function versus the human uh, lung functions. Digestive mechanisms, obtaining nutrients and digesting them, you're going to note, uh, we'll see that actually this very simple jellyfish, also known as a type of a hydra, has a one single gastrovascular cavity. And we have evolved from that. You know, we have a, a gastrovascular cavity, but obviously it is much more in depth with different types of intestines and a stomach and so on. But we did evolve from something very simple. 
Other examples, osmoregulation of bacteria, fish, and protists. So osmoregulation is regulating the amount of salt and ions and water in a system. And we learned earlier in the year about paramecians, how they have this contractile vacuole. So when it gets to be uh, too sort of hypertonic, the contrail bacterial is going to expel water uh, to balance that out. And fish have a similar mechanism. They can lose or gain water through their skin. They can actively transport ions through their gills, or they can uh, excrete concentrated uh, urine with lots of ions in it. Circulatory systems in fish, amphibians, and mammals. So looking at how we evolved from a simple two-chambered heart in a fish all the way to a four-chambered heart in mammals and birds. So we'll take a closer look at that. And then excretory systems in flatworms, earthworms, vertebrates, um, having to get rid of this uh, urine or get rid of this waste. And so you notice this highly develop, developed system of, of tubes and canals and sort of the same thing. Lots of tubes and canals in our kidney, which we call nephrons, and eventually leading out to a single opening. So very similar, which is kind of strange. All right, let's take a closer look at this gas exchange. So gas exchange depends a lot on the respiratory media. Is it air or is it water? And in fact, water has 40 times less dissolved oxygen than air. So if you live in the water like a fish, you're gonna have to come up with a very highly evolved system to extract that oxygen from that water. Now, all respiratory surfaces, no matter what organism it belongs to, has to have this high surface area to volume ratio, right, to be very efficient. We learned about that earlier in the year. They need to be thin and moist because think about it, oxygen and carbon dioxide need to be able to diffuse across that surface very easily. Now some simple animal, animals like this sponge, every single cell is a respiratory media. It's constantly diffusing, oxygen and carbon dioxide are constantly diffusing. Other animals like frogs and earthworms, uh, their skin is actually thin and moist enough to be that respiratory, respiratory surface. But higher animals like fish and animals, they have specialized protected organs like gills or lungs for that gas exchange. So what do we have in common? What's this common ancestor? Well, it's all, everybody needs to have oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse easily across the surface and then it needs to get into the bloodstream. So that's something that's very, very common between all systems. Let's take a closer look at aquatic animals. So gills, these are these outfoldings that are suspended in water, and fish need to ventilate them, right? So they need to move water against the gills, or they actually move the gills themselves to get water to go across. So then what happens is, is dissolved oxygen passes from the water to the blood. And this happens through a process called countercurrent exchange. So let's take a look at that process. So here we have the water flowing across the gills. So we're having 100% water to 10% water. Now here's the key. The blood is flowing the opposite direction. Their blood capillaries and vessels are going the opposite direction from the water. But there's always a difference in this percent oxygen so that it's always flowing from high to low. It's always flowing from the water to the bloodstream. In other words, it looks like this. So here we have the water coming in from the ocean. It's going across the gills. It's oxygenated, but then it drops off its oxygen and it leaves low in oxygen. The blood, remember, is flowing the other way. So it's coming in deoxygenated. It picks up the oxygen and then it leaves. Now, interestingly, this is the exact same system, this countercurrent exchange that your kidneys use to regulate water and salt ba balance in your nephrons. And it's the same system that uh, geese use in their legs and dolphins use in their fins in order to keep warm because their fins and their legs are further away from their uh, warm body core. So they use this countercurrent exchange, the idea of one system flowing in the opposite direction to exchange heat or to exchange water. Very interesting. Now, in, uh, in terrestrial animals, we don't have gills, we have lungs. So we breathe air, which is a different respiratory media, but we still need our membranes to be moist. We need a high surface area to volume ratio, and of course, we need those to be protected. But very similar to fish, we need this very close contact between the respiratory media and the capillaries. So right here, this is where that diffusion is happening of the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. Okay, circulatory systems. Now, one thing I'm not showing here is that fish have two, a two-chambered heart. Um, so you can we'll see what that looks like. It's very, very simple. So instead of me explaining to you this evolution of the circulatory system, system from two to four, and notice here the reptiles have this septum here, whereas amphibians do not. 
I want you to think about evolution of this. So how do these systems reflect both a common ancestry but also adaptation to a specific environment? That shouldn't be too hard. Now, we learned last unit that there can be many disruptions to homeostasis, even at the molecular and the cellular level. You guys did projects about drugs and how toxic substances can disrupt cell signaling. They can disrupt nerve function. Another example is dehydration of your cells and losing that tonicity. That's at the molecular and cellular level, but we can also have an ecosystem level disruption to homeostasis. And a really cool example, although it's awful, but it's invasive species. So here's an example. It's called the Japanese um, kudzu. It's a vine, and this is actually growing, even though it's from Japan, in Atlanta, Georgia. And you can see how this invasive species is just taking over this entire ecosystem and disrupting the normal balance and homeostasis. So another assignment, come up with one other invasive species and how it impacts that ecosystem. A secondary thing to homeostasis is uh, the idea of timing and coordination and how we have to have very specific events happening along with the environment uh, for plants, animals, bacteria to maintain homeostasis. So two examples for plants are phototropism and photoperiodism. So phototropism is how plants respond to light. Now it could be negative, which is away from light, or we more think of it as positive, which is going towards light. So what happens is, is we've got the tip of the plant or the tip of the shoot that receives the light signal. And so then the hormone auxin is then going to be released down the shoot, but when it's released, it's more concentrated on the darker side of the shoot. So this auxin hormone tells those cells on the darker side to elongate. So then what we have happening is on the shaded side, we've got these cells elongating, which actually pushes the plant towards the bright side, which is towards the light. So here's what that looks like. So here's our auxin, which used to be called IAA. It's more concentrated on the darker side. These cells elongate, which pushes the plant towards the light. So who knew? That's how plants grow towards the light. Now, photoperiodism is a little bit different. This is the response to the length of day or night. So plants have receptors called phytochromes that sense this amount of light, and they actually sense the wavelength of light as well. And they send signals to the plant to germinate or flower or something else. So we've got two broad categories, short day plants, which prefer the long night. So they're going to flower only when the night is long, when it exceeds this critical period. And then the long day plants, or short night, they only flower when the night is shorter than this critical period. So here's a quick figure showing this. So here's the short day plants. So here's the day. They need a short day, but they need a long night. And they need a long, uninterrupted night, which is interesting. So if there's a flash of light during this night, it's not going to flower. Whereas the long day plants, they need this uh, long day and they need the night time to be shorter than their critical uh, length. Okay, time and coordination in animals. We looked at plants. Well, animals have a similar thing going on called the circadian rhythm, which is also known as the biological clock or 24-hour clock. Lots of things go into this. Again, timing and coordination. Things like body temperature, blood pressure, molecules and hormones like melatonin, testosterone. Um, all of these things are going to kind of go into this clock, which is one reason why we experience jet lag. And that might be something I have you guys look into further in class. Okay, same with bacteria, timing coordination. So timing of events, all the bacteria have to be in the same place. They have to be releasing the same chemical. The chemical is then going to be um, sort of uptaked, uptaken by the bacteria, and then that signal is going to be released to release some sort of light or some sort of, of signal. In this case, it's um, luminescence. Same thing with fungi. Fungi have a very complex sexual and asexual life cycle uh, that relies on multiple cell types. It relies on the environment and timing with the environment. And so when everything is right, they're going to release these spores, or also called fruiting bodies. And that's actually what you're looking at when you look at molding bread or molding fruit. Okay, one last thing. It's a dynamic homeostasis. So it's not constant, but it can definitely change over time, especially when we look at a global ecosystem. And so I want you to think about one human impact and one geological or meteorolo meteorolo meteorological impact on either our local ecosystem in Ohio or the global ecosystem. And then finally answer these two questions, and we'll talk about all these mini assignments and these two questions in class.